Okay. Hello. Welcome. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back to How to Win Webinars. This is number what? Twelve? Number twelve. Number twelve. I'm seeing some weird screen that you just put up there, Steve. Oh, but it's sorry. Kind of cool How about this? How about this? How about... Yay! All right. And this is a special one for us um, because it allows us to bring in our a manager, uh, Rebecca Bray, who before she became our manager, that great step up in her career to become our manager, she was actually the chief of experience design at the Smithsonian. And so before waiting for Trump to actually do away with the entire museum, she got out while the getting was good um, and came over to the Center for Artistic Activism. And so we're thrilled to have her here. Um, in this new role, which is the uh, uh, this role is expert, an expert in experience design. Um, yeah. So welcome, Rebecca. Thank you. I'm usually here on the webinars, but I'm kind of lurking in the shadows usually. Yeah. Behind, behind a mask. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Um, so it's nice to be up front. Yeah. And in case you're wondering why Steve and I are wearing hats, um, it's really cold, <laughs> and it's snowing up here. But Rebecca's down in warmer climes where things are nice and sunny and there's probably little birds, birds tweeting. Exactly. But up here it's brutal. And cherry blossoms blooming. Exactly. Oh, yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah. She's been joining us from Washington, D.C. today. Yeah. Um, so what else, Steve, do we need to talk before we actually... Well, I guess we should probably mention that uh, w what we were going to do today was our um, Learn from Hollywood and have our big time Hollywood screenwriter Jason Grote, but you know, as big time Hollywood people do, he canceled last minute um, with good reason. We still we're love him. Have him on again soon. But the reason um, we wanted to have Rebecca talk about experience design is because often uh, we don't think of actions as an experience for the audience uh, and, and what the what the audience goes through. So it's like you know, you do this event, people come. They do it, they leave, right? The women's strike was uh, on Wednesday, and it's like a gathering. People talk, and then we march, and then that's it. But really, that is a form of an experience. And to think about how to cultivate the what kind of experience you want to cultivate and what, what the result you want to come from that, and being very thoughtful about it, you can get better results, right? Yeah, I think, Rebecca, when we were talking about this before, one of the things, and I think you'll be getting this, is really thinking about our, the spectator and taking them seriously, like what they're going to do, what they're going to think, what they're going to feel, and not just taking it for advantage, because I think we often think of museums, at least the old museums, like the ones I went to as a kid, you know, full of dusty, sort of like, you know, uh, glass cases and butterflies have been stuck with pins and stuff. But basically it's like, hey, this is science like it okay and you know I did like the dinosaurs but I didn't really like the stuffed stuff with Latin names but that's not what a museum is anymore is it well some are you know and as <laughs> won't name names I do work at the you know Smithsonian Natural History Museum and it's a fairly traditional institution I'd say but museums are changing um, you know I think that like the common thing between museums and artistic activists and activists in general is museums want to inform people and inspire people but oftentimes they think a lot about the informing and the inspiring and they don't think about the people part of that equation right. um, and so a lot of what I do is like I'm kind of a rogue person there because I'm thinking about the audience a lot and I'm thinking about their experiences um, like traditionally museums tend to think the way that they've thought about their audiences and kind of examine their audiences is they'll look and they'll say oh our demographics are we have a bunch of families with kids under 10 and then we have a group of um, you know adults who come in pairs and then we have school groups and that's how they think about their audiences um, but it's really very outdated and it's not a very complex complex kind of way of thinking about who these people are and what they care about and why they're there and that it really matters you know um, one thing that we always do with our new staff and our new volunteers is we do this new training which is we bring them in and we um, before they're kind of out in the museum we say okay so 
let's first, before you go out, let's just talk about like what what do you think people are doing out there in the museum? And and we write a whole list up on a board, and so people say, oh, people are, you know, they're walking around, they're looking at objects, they're reading the text about the objects. Um, you might have a family who's, um, you know, you have like parents who are just explaining stuff to kids um, and things like that. So we have a whole list. And then we say, okay, now you're going to go out to the museum and actually really observe people for 45 minutes. Mm. Um, before they do that, we, we give them tips on to how, how to not be too creepy. You know, with like yeah, I was just board. thinking someone like you know, behind me with a clipboard. I'm like, ooh. Yeah, so there are ways to not do that. Um, and so they come back after 45 minutes and um, we say, okay, so what did you actually see? And we start to write the list of what they actually saw. And they are always totally shocked because, mm. well, not only is the list of what they saw so much longer than the original list, but it's also there's such a variety of behaviors that people are exhibiting. Um, and they're surprising things, like there are barely any people who actually read the exhibit text. Um, there's also things like you have a lot, just as many families as you have that you have with kids who are, um, you know, parents who are talking to kids about what they're seeing, you have kids who are actually explaining to the parents. Mm -hmm. And so the reason why this matters, I mean, it doesn't really matter if you just want people to come into your museum and kind of walk around, but the fact is that museums have these missions, and, and particular exhibits have these missions. Like, you might have a mission for an exhibit, which is you want people to feel connected to the ocean so that they want to take action to protect it. Or, um, you know, you want to make more science literate citizens so that people understand how science works and how scientists use evidence in order to understand like things like evolution and climate change. And when you have science literate citizens, then you actually have more informed citizens and they're going to vote um, actually being informed about how science works. And so those are really big missions, right? And so you actually want to know when you're trying to engage an audience in your exhibit, if they're coming in and they they already feel connected to oceans, and you actually want to move them towards action. And you're going to deal with them very differently than with people who they don't even really know that there's a problem with oceans, right? Like they're you just want to make them aware of some of the issues. And I think about this in terms of a kind of continuum of engagement. Like over here, you have just awareness of an issue. Right. And People have to be aware of something, and then they have to be interested in order to move further down the line, which is then they feel like it's actually related to their lives, mm -hmm. and only after that will you make them feel like that they're involved in it, like they actually have some stake in this thing, and only after that will you get them to action. And, you know, it's like I do it like this, but it's often a nonlinear process, and in order to move people along, you actually, they have to have a constellation of experiences. So um, you're not going to just automatically go from awareness to relatedness to involvement to action. You probably, you might have an experience in a museum where you see some amazing exhibit about the ocean, but it's only when it gets reinforced by hearing about ocean acidification on the news or hearing from your family and from having a lot of different experiences that you're kind of going to move along the spectrum. Mm -hmm. So, so in the exhibit, cool. are you thinking about about all those different audiences and how you move them from step to step, or are you thinking of, okay, I'm going to be part of that varying experience that they have that moves them along, or both? Yeah, both. Um, so, you know, um, you can't do everything all at once, for sure. Um, you know, so... So you think about being kind of part of the constellation of experiences and um, really helping to make sure that you're providing a lot of different entry points into the issue. Um, I was thinking about this in relationship to artistic activism and, you know, I was thinking about like, so say you had a group of activists and they want to inform people about bees, like we talked about this, right? Um, 
and we could talk about a Trump example, and we could talk about a lot of different examples. But like, so say it's just like you want to go out there as a as your group, and you want to let people know about the enormous problem with bee populations right now. But what you what know? is the problem with bee populations right now? Just yeah, so there's um, there's right. colony collapse disorder. So there there's basically these problems of just millions of bees are dying, and um, but isn't that good? I mean, I hate when bees sting and stuff like that. <laughs> well, there's this little problem of pollination, and actually, uh, these are pretty crucial to a huge amount of our food supply. I and think it, the country is Polynesia, not pollination. Pollination. <laughs> so. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Please continue. I apologize. <laughs> um, so. So if you have a group and you're going out and you want to like you want to let people know about bees, right? And so you have like some really crazy costumes and you have like bee twister and you also have a bunch of petitions that you want people to sign. Mm -hmm. And your group comes back from this action and you're so bummed out cuz you're like we didn't get 200 people to to sign our petitions. And they're like we like we we failed. Um, but, you know, what if, if in this town square that you're in and you're doing this action, actually Ooh. the majority of the people have never heard about the bee issue, and you're trying to get them over here to action, and they haven't even started over here with awareness. And right. so you could actually, maybe you were successful in terms of getting people along the awareness spectrum, but you don't even know that. And so that's why it's important to actually know what's happening with your audience and where they are in the spectrum so that you can know when you're successful and you also know where to focus your efforts. So how do, how do we do that? Like, I mean, when you're in a museum, you can actually interview people, you can do surveys of people, you can talk to them and so on and so forth. Oftentimes we're sort of, like I'm thinking about this picture that's up there, we're going out to a town square. Um, and we're going to do a demonstration. Should we be thinking about a multiplicity of audiences if we don't yeah. know who's going to be there? Or like, how would you approach that as yeah. a as an experienced designer? Yeah, I mean, even in the museum, the museum I work in is the is like the second most visited museum in the world. We have eight million people coming in the door every year, so we can't interview all of them. It'd be really nice if you go into the museum and you have someone who's kind of like, well, what do you think about science? And like, you know, what are you interested in? And you kind of show them around and have this concierge. But we can't do that. And so one way that you can address this problem of like all these people are at different points in the spectrum of engagement is that you can try to have lots of different entry points. Mm. Right? So you're hitting people at lots of different places. That can get pretty big and pretty messy and like you can't do everything for everyone so the other thing that you can do is be interactive mm -hmm. so that whatever you're making is really responsive to your audience and they have some agency in that um, and and you know I'm not just talking actually it's funny I I went into museums because I was an expert in interactive technology and so I went in to do things in museums like big immersive pro interactive projections and things with mobile phones but I've been in museums now for about nine years and I've really kind of changed what I'm interested in because I think with technology, even with good interactive technology, you can do a lot over here with the kind of um, interest, surprising people and getting them interested and aware. But if you want to really move people along in this relatedness and relevancy and involvement to action, this middle section is the more challenging and more interesting place. And so I've found that the way to get people moving along in here, you actually need to have people-to-people -people interaction and you need to have hands-on kinds of things where people are um, making decisions and they're really involved. And I can give you an example of that. Hold on one second. Okay. Can you put up the, I want to hear the example, but can you, Steve, can you put up the image of the bees again? Yeah. Bee people. Uh, here we are. So if I'm hearing you correctly, Rebecca, it's like what these folks are doing really well is on the surprising front. It's like all of a sudden there's a dude dressed in a bee costume. There's some people on the left that are wearing beekeepers outfits and they have these bright 
orange or bright yellow signs. I mean, yeah. I would notice this in any town green, right? And I'd probably go over there, right? Mm -hmm. But if you were to work with these people as an experienced designer, what would you say for them to them to get to that second point, that 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 point of engagement with people, so they're not just oh I get it and walk away because that's what I do at museums often, I'm particularly art museums. I'm like, huh, boom, I'm to the next one, right? So one thing is, you know, so there's signs like save the bees. If you fail to act, bees will die. So if I have no idea why I should care about bees, none of these signs are going to work for me. I need to know that I'm not going to have food in the supermarket if the bees die, right? So that's one thing is just thinking about your audience and if they have no idea about the issue, how do you create a situation where they are informed about it and it actually makes a difference to them mm -hmm. um, instead of just delivering facts? And I'm thinking also about the person-to-person -person here. That is, is, it's great to have people with signs but you also need a ring, and I've seen activists do this really well, is have a ring of people. We did this in Ireland, Steve. Remember, there was people on the outskirts, and I think you were one of them, in which as people would come up, you just kind of sidle up to them and say, hey, do you know what this is about? And then start a conversation, which allows you to bring some of that in. Because if you go up to someone with a sign, it just looks like they're going to club you with it, right? <laughs> or that they've already made up their mind, and you're an idiot for not knowing this sort of stuff, you know? Totally. So the very thing that engages people at the level of surprise or attraction may actually be the thing which pushes people away at the level of engagement and understanding. Exactly, exactly. And that's that's exactly what we try to do. You know, um, we were talking earlier about the saber-toothed tiger. Exactly. Ah, so, cute. Uh, I'm, I'm on it. <laughs> awesome. Um, so, okay, so you could have you know, like you were saying earlier, like typical museum experience, you have an exhibit and you have some stuff behind glass. Um, and so you could have like a skull, mm -hmm. right? And so so you, um, it's in an exhibit and you have people go up to it and they say, whoa, that is <laughs> I'd say whoa to that. <laughs> yeah. And then so they can say, oh, that's cool, right? And then they can maybe read the text and see what it is. Mm -hmm. um, and then... But then, you know, so then you want to improve on that, right? And so you want to get beyond just delivering, you know, this kind of static experience. And so you could have a volunteer there mm -hmm. who, said, you know, brings people up and they say, hey, you know, did you see, see this skull, this animal? Um, do you know what it is? It's a saber-toothed tiger and, here, and it went extinct. And that's actually often the default with our, with our volunteers and our staff, actually, which is just to deliver information and facts. Now... On the other hand, what if you did something like this? What if you had a skull of a saber-toothed tiger? And when people come up to you, you say to them, so where are you from? Mm -hmm. Now, we know from experience, we've done a lot of studying with this, and people love to talk about where they're from. It's a great entry point, especially in the, in our, the National Museum of Natural History, because you have people from all over the country and all over the world, and they're away from home. So it, already you're giving them agency, and it becomes about their story. Um, so you say, oh, do you, so you're from Montana, do you have any big cats there, like mountain lions or something? So already, I say, bam, like they're in, they're telling stories about what they've seen and what their cousin has seen and like all this stuff. And so, again, it becomes about them telling a story, not about mm -hmm. you delivering facts to them. Um, and then you can go somewhere with it with saying, okay, imagine you found this skull when you're out hiking near your house how would you start to figure out what it is, mm. right? So you give oh. them a kind of challenge, and you also make them the protagonist of the story, right? You give oh. them something like something they can imagine happening, um, and then you, from there you could go into, well, you know, the way that the sci some of our scientists do it is when they find stuff out in nature, they come back to our collections. And so right here, like, take a look. I have these ten skulls from other big cats from our collection. Let's take a look at these and compare. This is what scientists do. do. They'll compare something and then they'll like look, they'll observe very carefully the physical characteristics and then they'll, they'll compare to these other things. And so then you get them really active, they're engaged, they're actually looking and feeling. Um, and then you can go from there into 
all sorts of things depending on where the conversation is and depending where on where that particular person is coming from because maybe this person um, already knows about evolution um, and but you can get them to the point of talking about biodiversity mm -hmm. or talking about talking more deeply about how scientists use evidence so you're giving them entry points in you're making the story about them and you're giving them a challenge and you're also letting the conversation be driven by where they actually they already are and what they are interested in cool. and so with a great facilitator you can go in all sorts of directions to get them much deeper and much closer into your mission whatever it is Steve can you put up the B again yeah so how about we ask uh, our folks out in webinar land um, three things that just came out of this, right? Which is, okay, we've got them involved in surprise, right? Um, and we've gotten their attention. But to get them further along the line, the three things you said is kind of approach people where they already are, okay? And in the, you, you, the example you gave, it was like physical location, right? But yeah. I think it, it could also work metaphorically, right? Yeah. Um, and then the other point was make the story about them, mm -hmm. right? which kind of goes with that. And then there was also this sort of engage them as a protagonist in the story. Okay? Yeah. Okay, so is that right? That those are three kind of key themes in that. So let's look at this, everybody out there, um, and figure out, like, how can we meet people, the imaginary crowd that's now assembled to see us do this spectacular creative action, and kind of move them along that line so we're engaging them at a different level by making them a protagonist of the story, by engaging them where they are and making the story about them. And if you, so you can just write in a question or write into the chat and then we can, I'll, I'll relay that to uh, Rebecca and Steve. Um, in the meantime, while we're waiting for that, I want to go back to, you were talking about what's happening when people are in a museum and then yeah. people have these assumptions about what's happening and then they go and look and they find out what's really happening. And I think that would be a good assignment for a protest, right? I mean, even just looking at this picture, like what happens at a protest? You, people go, they bring signs, they listen to what the speaker says, they learn something, and then they leave empowered. And like when you actually watch what's happening, you know, people aren't necessarily listening, they're milling around, they're talking to each other, they look lonely, or they're talking to someone that they already came with, they're not talking. Yeah. Lot with each other, you know, there's probably a lot of things I'm not even picking up on because I'm not looking at what's actually happening. I have an idea of, of how protest works, right? Totally. But organizers also, you know, it's like, well, then we'll have a, a stage and there'll be an event on the stage and everyone will watch that. But right. it doesn't always work out that way. Like, people don't pay attention that way or they're, you know, they're tired from walking around and so they're just looking for a place to sit, you know? Right. And they also, they probably want to be the speaker. They want to be the protagonist, right? Yeah. They don't want to be in the audience. They want to be, like, engaging with people the same way the organizers are. And so it's a, that would be a, a good place to go back and research as far as, like, how, how to improve those kinds of traditional protests. You know? yeah. The brilliance. I, oh, go on, Rebecca. Well, I even think, you know, one thing that we do is when we're developing a new interactive activity in my team is we always have an observer who is watching. And I think it'd be great if when you do an action, the first time you do it, you do it as a test. Hmm. You know, you always, you never do it once. And the first time you do it, it's really what you think of as a pilot and you have at least one person who's just observing. Now, the only problem... Um, is like you can have confirmation bias, right? Like it's really easy to see what you're expecting to see. And so what we do is we actually have um, in the evaluate the official like kind of formal evaluation world, it's called instruments, but it's basically like a piece of paper that is guiding you to look for specific kinds of behaviors. And you've determined beforehand what kinds of things you're looking for that people might be doing. Um, and those are going to be, you're going to create those things that you're looking for based on what you think success looks like um, or all of your degrees of success, right? Because the success is not just one thing. It's not just petitions or it's not just people taking photos, but it can be lots of different things. And, you know, I 
I can totally share those also with everybody on the webinar. Um, yeah, right. and the link of just like what are what are some way what's that kind of piece of paper that you could bring out that could help you to make impartial observations that then you could use as data when you're reflecting back on what actually happened. Mm -hmm. I love that so idea. Back to uh, Steve's question, we've got some answers here, which oh, cool. is what the question was, and and you can still type these in, and and I can relay them. Uh, what can we do to at this example event, like in order to bring people along? Oh. So, uh, and further engage, right? Um, or more entry points. So Amanda <coughs> had a couple suggestions. One was ask them about their favorite fruits or vegetables and then talk about how those are pollinated. Totally. Right? Yeah. And then you can lead into the threats and stuff, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then the other one is talk about their gardens or like what grows, I guess, in their neighborhood um, and then poll and pollinators they've spotted and how to grow plants that encourage bee pollinators to come Combined. I like that one because that's moving from the problem to also the solution as well in one kind of move. Yeah. One thing, um, so one of my friends um, who is an amazing museum person who also is like really rogue in the museum world um, because the way that she does that. I love that idea of like, you know, rogue in the museum world. I know. She wears, she wears, like, she wears like, yeah, like, ground, or I was thinking like blue tweed as opposed to gray tweed. <laughs> totally. Um, so she, um, she, she actually works in like in history, um, and so we think of it like you know just like going to a history museum, and it's it's really it can feel really static, right, and not very relevant. And she actually was working on a historical colonial farm. You know, there's people in historical period costumes, and there's this old farm and stuff. And so she was trying to figure out, how do I make this feel relevant to people? And um, one of the things she did is she created this program for school kids. And um, so the kids would come in, and I think there was a guy, kind of a facilitator, who he would say, um, okay, we're going to time travel. We're going to go back into, like, 1870 on this farm, and, you know, these people, these farmers, it was really rough for them. So we're going to bring them some tools from modern times, and we're going to choose which ones we're going to give to them to make their lives easier. So the kids go back, and they meet this woman who's working on the farm, and things are really hard for her, and she kind of tells them about her day-to-day -day life, and it's, like, really rough. Um, so they open up this bag of things that have been brought from, from modern times, and the first thing... Um, that comes out is pesticides, right? And so they say to her, um, yeah, we have this thing. It's going to make, you know, you don't have to worry about all these pests. And she really wants it. Mm -hmm. But the kids are also, they know that this pesticide, which is like DDT, like something really horrible, is going to completely delete the soil, de deplete the soil in the coming generations. So the kids really start debating amongst themselves whether to give this to this woman, and she really wants it, right? And so, again, they're the protagonists, but you're mm. also getting at something interesting. They're using critical thinking skills and creativity and everything to get at some essential question which is relevant, which is what um, when you're making a choice about what is convenient, you have to think about what the implications are. Mm -hmm. And we have to do this all the time. Right? Of like the convenience of any sort of tool and technology and all of these things, how do you start to consider all of the payoffs and how do you think about what might happen in the future? I, I want to come back to this idea of a protagonist because oftentimes when we think of having a demonstration or doing an art action, we think in terms of spectators, right? Yeah. Um, and so how do we, and maybe we can throw this out to the audience, how do we actually make people protagonists like your friend, the rogue agent of the museum world, you know, yeah. made those kids into actually steering the drama itself? Like, totally. how, how do you do that in an art action sense or a, a traditional protest sense? So let's, yeah, let's um, get some feedback. From while, people, while people are putting stuff up, I'll give it a couple of examples. I mean, one of the reasons why when I was an organizer with Reclaim the Streets, I was really interested in their model, was that, that what we would do is we would essentially kind of, it was like a potluck protest, 
in a lot of ways, is that we'd say, we're going to do this here. This is the general theme. We'll bail you out of jail. That was basically it. And people would show up, you know, with fire breathing apparatus, you know, and uh, dressed in bunny costumes and all sorts of things. And what I really loved about that is that sense of you show up and the protest wasn't someone else's already. It was actually yours. You became part of the spectacle. Right? Yeah, that's awesome. That's so great. I've got one, uh, one thing here from, or a comment from Adela that I think is a good question. So she said, commenting on improvements on protest marches demonstrations, there is uh, a path in front of us still, I agree, but I have been seeing bands and marching bands coming in and encouraging people in dance and singing, which is a great way to make protests more fun and engaging. What, what do you think about that, Rebecca? So, so this is people bringing their own instruments. So it becomes something that is more, that people no, are making. Have, well, yeah, there are, I think, people bringing their own instruments, but they're also trying to bring it, you know, get other people to dance and sing and participate in that. Yeah, I mean, the I think marching that's, band movement. Yeah, I think that that's great. I think it's also important to recognize in that, like, who, what is, what is your goal there? You know, I mean, I think that that works if you're talking about, in, your, in our spectrum, talking about people who are already involved and you want them to stay involved, these are maybe the people who are already taking action. And so it's a good way to keep people going and keep people inspired and feel like they're part of a community. If that's your goal, that's good. If you want to do anything else along the spectrum and you want to engage people who are not already engaged, then there are other things that you might want to do with the protest. Although I like the idea, one of the things I love about music and protests, anytime I go to a big rally, I look for the samba band. Um, and why is because when you start dancing, you actually in some way become part of the thing which is around the band. I mean, that's why like dancing is actually almost a, particip a participatory act, right? Yeah. And if we start thinking about what I loved is your sort of stages of engagement, I might go to a demonstration. But if I start dancing in a demonstration, um, or I start chanting in a demonstration, or I start repeating people's words in a people's mic in a demonstration, I kind of find myself actually being now a participant. And yeah. so then when someone comes to me and kind of wants me to take me that one step further, uh, I'm much more game than the person who's sitting back like this, watching right. these things, you know? Right. Um, so I think that music can work in that way to sort of break down those barriers so you're already inside, your body's inside there, and so on. Right, and that's going to work a lot more profoundly on you than is if you're just watching people who have signs. In your exactly, family. exactly. Yeah. Steve, uh, what you like? I, Steve, you have a different experience of Reclaim the Streets than I did. Mm -hmm. My Reclaim the Streets experience was in uh, Berkeley. Yeah, well... <laughs> <laughs> well, and the idea was like, oh, we're going to have this big street party and then everyone will join in and like nobody joined in. And I, and I think that, that that engagement to the dancing part was like a, a bigger leap than everyone expected. So they had music and they didn't do it. Yeah, people just stood and were like, what what are these freaks doing? Huh. In Berkeley. And so, uh, so I think like, thinking about... Like, how we how you move people along those stages you know like um if you walked into a party and there was just like no barely anybody there and really loud thumping music it would seem weird usually a party works up to the dancing right so it's like appetizers mm -hmm. sitting around talking and then like you know you build up to the to the, the wildness right exactly. um, i've got other feedback here uh some good stuff uh one thing is todd uh, says, what if as you rally down the street, the people on the outskirts engaging the crowd and ask them to vote on where the march will go? Yes. So, oh, so nice. so, oh, that's cool. So, so this is what critical mass used to do, right? <laughs> you had a, you'd have a general sort of contour of where you're going to go. But basically, yeah. where it was decided, where the, where the critical mass ride would go, had everything to do with who happened to be in front of the of the of the uh, of the critical mass, and it was this great participatory feel because you didn't quite know where it's going to go. So that's I think it's an awesome idea. So Gonzalo uh, says, give them a shareable moment. Mm. Like, 
I think he means share, like something for them to share. So it can be as simple as a sculpture that they can take a silly picture with. Yeah, right? totally. And and that happens at museums where in the yeah. exhibit it's like you. I, I was at the Desert Museum or somewhere in Arizona, and they were talking about these bats, and you could stand and have big bat ears, and you both hear what it's like for the to have big ears. Yeah. But of course, we took pictures with the giant ears. Right. And if you know, and probably in the exhibit, like if you have where you take the picture, there's also like a hashtag or something. Yes. Right? So when you yeah. share the picture, you also see where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. so I've got um, one more from Stephanie, uh, and she says, at the Women's March in Boston last January, speakers did two things that engaged the massive crowd. One, we were asked to turn to a stranger and ask why they were marching that day. That's brilliant. It's kind yeah. of beautiful. And then yeah. that, that makes everyone's mm. sort of story matter, right? Like you're... Totally. Yeah. And then uh, number two is we all pledged our allegiance to resistance, to stay engaged and active with our hands and our hearts. I appreciate that I appreciated that we were involved through those actions and it has kept me accountable. Mm. Oh, I like that. Yeah. Because at that moment when you make that pledge in front of all those people, you are making that movement and you're becoming a protagonist in the struggle. You're no longer a spectator at that point. Right. I think, you know, we often think about before we go out and do something, um, we map out actually what are all the different things that um, the audience might do, think, and feel. Um, and those three are critical, right? Because mm -hmm. actually learning something is more than just thinking, like learning a fact. Doing, thinking, and feeling are really all together important. And so we try to map that out and we try to have as many points of entry for people to do and think and feel. And we try to minimize our involvement, actually. So it's like, mm -hmm. how many things can we do to create situations where pe the audience is actually acting? And that's yeah. a real flip, right? And actually, I wanted to ask you guys to describe what you did in Dublin, because it seemed like there was some things in there that really, um, I think, are good examples of this kind of interactive activist situation. So I'll give the back. Oh, go on. Can I, before we do, I just had this idea about what to ask the B people or what, what to ask the audience if you're, you're in that B protest. Yeah. Which is like, okay, you know, you're a legislator and this now you understand this problem. If you were in charge, what would you do as a, yeah. as a, to create protections? Or, and then let them um, imagine how that would work and then say, these are the bills that are actually being presented and then you can see that they're really weak or there are none, right? And it's like, yeah. so this, the, the, this isn't in line with what you would say. There's another thing that uh, I thought was great, which was they would have, have people draw how they thought wealth was sort of distributed among, you know, the, the different percents, the 1%, the 30, you know, whatever. Yeah. How, and and how wealth was distributed in the United States, and so people would draw their chart and then they'd lay the the real thing yeah. over it, right? But you don't know what it is until you draw yours. Yeah. And it's so uh, out of whack that no one ever gets it close. Like I I I have studied this stuff and I knew it was way out of whack and like still drew it conservatively, right? That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Like actually, you doing the action makes such a huge difference. It was so different than if you just saw that graphic, right? Because yeah, you and as much as I left Bernie Sanders, him talking about, you know, the one, the the one percent of the one percent and all that stuff. You know, it's like it's just very different being told than being like, well, I think it's like this, and then being like, oh my god, you know, it's so totally. much worse. Totally. Um, and you can do that with B populations too. You can say, you know, you might have heard like, how bad do you think it is? Yeah. Over time, like draw the thing, and they're like, "Oh, guess what? You know, like oh you're, it's better than you think." <laughs> and we we want to keep it from being as bad as you might think it is, or yeah. way worse than that, actually. Yeah. Oh. But also, the like putting them in the situation of figuring out how to solve it is a pretty great thing too, because if you're in that situation where you're not just thinking about how bad it is, but you're actually having to think about how to solve it, then it create, and then again, you're the kind of protagonist in. You're kind of implicated in doing that. We did something similar to that where we were talking about bioethics and like new technologies and new things that we can do um, with genetics right now 
And so we had this kind of activity where people are given money, they're given fake coins, and they're also given roles as you know, a scientist, as um, a politician who's voting on things, and as a citizen. And they need to spend their money and decide on um, how to deal with these like complicated ethical issues, but in ways that are pretty straightforward and feel like a game as well. Mm. Cool. There's another example of uh, somebody we've worked with named Ida Benedetto, and she created a, a, a party game where there were like regulators, and then there were carbon uh, offsets or something, and you would trade them. And I think she knew this was going to happen, but what people would do is like take their thing they were the, the pollution or whatever they were responsible for, and just drop it on the ground. And so, because you could get away with it, right? Like you could not pay the fee, you could not make the trade, oh, you could man. sort of. And so, at, as the party went on, the, the place was just littered with the things that nobody wanted in the game. And if you got rid of them, you would win, right? And they all wanted to win. And so it it acted. It's like, look, if there, there's no enforcement to these regulations, this is what's going to happen, and you did it, you know. Man. Yeah, it's really physicalizing it too. Physicalizing yeah. the media. So you wanted us to talk about what we did in Dublin, and actually, I'm I can pull up some pictures. That's what I was hoping for. Okay, so I'm going to set the background for it. So uh, the Center for Artistic Activism went to Dublin, Ireland, uh, in December, to work with. European-based sex workers and artists around decriminalization of sex work. Um, the sex workers feel that as long as sex work is still criminalized, it means they will be treated by criminals, by the police, by Johns, and essentially drive the industry underground um, and disallow them from organizing as laborers, having fundamental work rights applied to them, and so on and so forth. So in any case, what we did is we worked with about 20 sex workers and artists, and artists who were sex workers, and we do this five-day workshop the first couple of days, or a lot of the issues that we've covered over in these webinars. And then um, the final thing we do is in 24 hours we brainstorm, build props for, and execute a street action. And so this was our street action. So Steve, do you want to describe it a bit? Sure, so um, there's a few elements here, but for the sake of time, I'll, I'm going to skip through them um, and give you an overview. So we're in this sort of public square in front of a big church. There's a statue of Molly Malone, which we might see in a minute. And uh, the tent in the background and the yellow or the red umbrellas, those are part of it. And what you would do is come and uh, we offered a one euro uh, hand massage. So you could pay a euro and then, uh, you know, like, uh, like in the airport, right? But we wanted it to be intimate and face-to-face, -face. so we didn't do shoulders because then the person's behind you. So they would actually sit and face each other and talk about their day a little bit. And then the, they would say, you know, this whole thing, uh, I, I'm actually a sex worker. And then the person, they're already holding hands, right? And so they're like, oh, and they can't react too much because they're in the interaction already. And they'd say, and um, technically, because I'm a sex worker and you paid a euro, you are now a client. And, uh, and then they would start to explain the, the problems. Like, and because there's two of us here, two sex workers side by side, this, according to the law in Ireland, means that this is a brothel. And the people are like, what? You know, and they're like, yeah, you know, it helps us to work al alongside each other, as you can imagine. But these laws are... Um, create these complications and problems that affect our safety and so on. And they say, you know, and if you like, now that you understand this, you can be arrested and um, have your mugshot taken with Santa, because this was like a week before Christmas. So they would get arrested with like paper handcuffs that had information. And at this point, I'm summarizing it, but they've been oriented. And then um, they would get taken over to this mugshot area and have their picture taken, and then they would get a little card. We also had a peep show where they could talk. Let me see if I have any other uh, pictures that can help explain this. But we had all different kinds of people engage in this, understand, and like again have this more complete experience. So telling them about the laws around sex works, you have to get over the stigma and all that first. But bringing them through this experience, um, and there were many entrance points. There was the uh, this is one of my favorite pictures. 
there, were, uh, there was the peep show. There was the um, there was the hand massage. There was me out on the edges talking to people that were too shy to approach. And so we had so we ended up talking to you know dozens if not hundreds of people and arresting I forget how many um, in our like fake fake uh, arrest action thing. So you get the idea, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, and that's exactly it. So I like I love <laughs> parts of that, which is it's yeah highly interactive, lots of different points of entry for different p kinds of people, right? So and yeah. even for the spectators who are hanging back on the edges it seems like it's super legible for them, right? Mm -hmm. And that's important because you're always going to have people, again, who are kind of over here on your spectrum, and you need to have entry points for them to even just enter into the conversation. And then you had something for everyone um, all along the way. Um, and it's also really physical. Um, it's really social. You know, there's, all, there's something for everyone in there. Although I think if we were to do it again, because it was a draft, and that's our whole point is you do yeah. it as a draft, is that we weren't as good with the people that we couldn't make physical contact with on the outsides. We didn't have that one sheet piece of propaganda. We had this really nice stylized Christmas card for those people who came in, um, but we never made the sort of like, okay, if you're just passing by and you're curious for a second, here, take this with you. Here's what this is about. Here's what you can do. Right. Um, and so next time we do it, we'll do that. Yeah. Uh, someone else has been arrested. So um, Those are our well, we have a, just a few minutes left, and so if anybody has any questions, you can start typing those in now. Um, but this has yeah. been a good conversation. Is there anything else you want to say, Rebecca, that we didn't Well, I mean, just like to kind of summarize, as people are typing in comments or questions, I think some really great things are to do is before your action, don't just think about what you and your group are doing going to be doing, but think about what the audience will do and think and feel. One thing that we often do is have user scenarios. So we'll pick a couple of different kind of profiles of the kind of people that we think will be in the area, and we think through how they will experience what will happen. Mm -hmm. and then during the action, I think having an impartial, well, not necessarily impartial, they might be partial, but an observer who's really devoted to just watching what's happening mm -hmm. is critical. And then, of course, coming back after the action and reflecting on it and um, talking about tweaking and refining it. You know, we refine our stuff in the museum like 10 times before it's final, but it can be just two. You know, just two times is going to vastly improve your, your visitor engagement or your user engagement. Um, and I think, you know, sometimes that can sound exhausting, I imagine, to like, oh, we have to iterate this and do it again and again, but I think it's actually less exhausting, like if you think about our B people, it's probably more dispiriting and exhausting to come away feeling like you failed with your petitions than um, to actually have the group feel like you know what progress you're making and you know what you're trying to do with your audience. It can be so fantastic to come back from doing an action or doing an interactive thing in a museum and really as a group be able to pinpoint what it is that you accomplished and what people, your audience, was um, getting from that interaction. That's so um, while we're getting in these questions, I just wanted to um, whoa, um, to uh, point out we've got our next webinar is uh, Learn from South Africa. I put the link for the registration for it in the chat. Um, and the, the idea behind this is um, other activists around the world have been dealing with far, I would say, far more similar political environments to the political environment that we have now than what our political environment has been 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Um, and one of the places is South Africa, where you know, oftentimes the state is not responsive. Oftentimes the state is not even rational. Oftentimes the state has, you know, doesn't listen to its opposition. And I think what we've thought is we need to learn from activists in other parts of the world like South Africa. We're also going to try to bring in our activist friends from Russia and our activist friends from Italy um, as ways to think about how do we learn how to navigate in a different political terrain. Yeah. So you can register for that. You can also look at the past webinars um, and I'm putting up a link for that. We've got all of them online right now with 
uh, archive video and all the notes that we include and things like that. And um, again, if you have any questions, just type them in. Um, so far, I'm not seeing much, so I, I guess we've been very clear this time. But um, now's your chance if you if you have any um, thoughts or closing questions. Uh, last is uh, these are free, partly because of the donations that you have already made or are making. Um, this is a link to our donate page where you can make a one-time donation or you can just set up a recurring uh, uh, monthly donation, whatever you can afford, and it does make a difference um, in, in what we can do. So um, the, that's all we have, right? And um, if any questions show up, I will relay them to you. But do we have anything else we need to say? No, I think we're, I think we're good. So Rebecca, I just want to say, it's so good to get you on this side of the camera. Yes, that I love it. really awesome. And I think one of the things I love is, one, learning a lot about experience design, but also learning that we can learn from all sorts of different situations, mm -hmm. right? And that we can learn from experience design. We can learn from people who are doing advertising. We can learn from folks who are writing screenplays in Hollywood. We can learn from people that love playing video games. Um, mm -hmm. Steve, you're taking your students to see professional wrestling next week, right? It's in a couple weeks, yeah. The road to WrestleMania stops in White Plains, New York, and my students will be there. Exactly. Uh, yeah, so I, I was a, I'm a convert to wrestling. There's a lot to learn there. Yeah. Um, and we made a podcast about it, which you can uh, listen to. I'll put a link up for that in a second. But we do have a, a question here from Adela Wagner. Um, she wants to know if we ever do live uh, teaching and if of course we do. Steve, Rebecca, do you guys want to talk about that while I get the podcast sure. up? Um, in fact, that's what we usually do. That's what we often do. Um, we do live teaching. We do a series of workshops um, over multiple days, and we also do workshops sometimes in three-hour batches or five-hour or day-long. Um, so we do all sorts of, uh, of, of live teaching. In fact, that's how we started. Um, Rebecca, what, what should someone do if they want to know more about the live teaching we do? Yeah, so um, you can definitely email manager at artisticactivism.org. That will go to me, and I can give you more info about upcoming opportunities. One thing, if you're in New York, um, we will be doing something at Creative Capital on May 4th in the evening, and that will be something that people can sign up for. So um, if, email me if you're interested in that. I'll give you more info. And I just put up the uh, link for the podcast. Um, if you if you can't get enough of us, it's there's ten episodes. You can listen to it while you're walking around at the grocery store. Um, it's all about what we can learn from pop culture. So um, there's that too. So I, I think we're good. Um, thank you all for attending and your attention. And we hope this was a, a beneficial experience. Right. Yes. Yeah. Educational um, experience. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to look into booking a vacation in uh, pollination. Yeah, pollination. We should all go to pollination and I do know. a trip. Yeah, <laughs> tropical vacation and pollination. And um, we'll be back. When is the next one? The, next week. Is that one? Is it next week? Yeah. All right. Okay. So, yeah, so register for that, and we'll see you next week. All right. All right. Bye. Bye.